Hey, hey. Good morning. Hi there. Um, now, uh, just a brief uh, positive history of the internet uh, before we begin. <laughs> As everyone knows, the internet was invented in 1989 by a group of cats wishing to distribute memes about themselves. <laughs> then co-opted by humans in 1990 so they could send high-speed photos of their genitals and buy at 2am uh, cos uh, costumes of Cersei Lannister. Well, at least that's my browsing history. Um, <laughs> The real stars of the internet, however, are to my left. Let me give a few stats. So you've got 1.7 billion views across six YouTube channels. Not only number one in the United Kingdom uh, Sunday Times bestsellers list, but also New York Times bestsellers. Uh, please welcome my, uh, my fantastic guests this morning, Dan Howells and Phil Lester, a.k.a. Dan and Phil. Hi. Hey. Yeah! Yeah. <laughs> I see we've got some of our followers yeah. in the audience. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi I just want to flag something. You came here of your own volition, right? We didn't pay you yeah. to be a, not a Donald Trump thing. Okay, just to flag that. You brought a lot of needed youth vigor to the uh, yes. uh, international <laughs> conference. Age diversity <laughs> yeah. they really needed. Mm. Um, let's start at the very, very beginning. Where did you two first meet? Origin. <laughs> On the internet. <Yeah. laughs> Normal people don't read. You might want to qualify that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's as dodgy as it sounds, to be honest, isn't it? Um, yeah. Social media strangers. Social media, like, Dan was coming to university in Manchester, and then we hung out in Manchester, made a video, and then more people watched it than a normal video, and we were like, hang on, we might be onto something here, making a video together. So then, ten, are we like nine years later, eight years later? Oh, God, don't make me, we're not part of your demographic yeah. anymore, are we? We're, we're crusty at this stage. Yeah. yeah. So, t you found that together, you, you know, two of you are better than one. How many videos were you getting when you first started? What was the number of, of hits you had? I'd say we got about 400 views. <sighs> that was epic back that, in that 2008 or something. Yeah. I mean, the thing is YouTube now, we all know it as this big mainstream thing with, you know, big YouTubers doing it as jobs. But when we both started, it was a hobby and YouTube was this niche website. It wasn't even skateboarding cats. It was like weirdos on the internet talking to other strange people on cameras that look like potatoes and no one thought it was going anywhere. Yeah. I mean, how long were you doing it for? I've, I've gone past 10 years on YouTube now, <laughs> which is crazy. I was like the original YouTube dinosaur. Is anyone here 10? Yeah. <laughs> You're God. not 10. <laughs> you look You're 10. You're not 10, 10 years Don't old. Worry. Um, but yeah, I, I saw some Americans just making these video blogs and I was like, I could, I could give that a go. Just switched on the webcam, which is a black and white one I got in a serial promotion. And I was like, origin okay, story. origin story there. Uh, switched on, just talk, it was the most boring video ever, just talking about my day and what has been happening. And then I had one comment from Australia and I was like, hang on, why does this person from Australia? The internet is America. Yeah, like what's yeah. happening with this? So then once I had that first comment, I was like, well, okay, that's, that's an audience, so I'm gonna keep this going. But you just did it as a hobby. Like yeah. you, did, you weren't even trying to make entertainment no. when it started. It, well, I, I like to think it was slightly entertaining. <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I had, Sorry. I had about 10 subscribers for a year, and then that went up to 100. And then I, I just kept going from there, because I thought, if someone wants to watch me, I'm going to keep making this stuff. So what were you doing um, alongside that? Were you working? Were you... Well, I was working in WH Smith, uh, having a bit of a, a miserable time, and then someone threw a chocolate orange at my head, and I was like, okay, no, enough is enough. Done with retail. Uh, <laughs> on a practical note, when they yes. threw it, did it split into individual segments? Uh, <laughs> I like to think it did within the box. You got um, like the cardboard edge. I got the cardboard the face, edge to the you, face. Because so, yeah. yeah. they usually say tap it and unwrap it, not throw it at somebody's head no. and then unwrap it. That could be their new marketing campaign though. <laughs> it might, yeah. it might. <laughs> so, a nerd, chocolate orange. Yeah. Yeah. So you were working to Blitch Smith and you were starting, you, you, uh, things were starting to happen and you were, you were getting people in Australia paying attention. Yes, what I about, was. What about you? What are you doing at this point? Well, I started a few years later than Phil and back in the YouTube community, this, you know, to everyone here, it's completely like distant knowledge, but when Phil started, no one was on YouTube. There were mm. literally a few thousand users, people just talking to each other. When I started, people had already started doing comedy sketches, little web series, uh, vlogging about their life. But this was pre-Google buying YouTube, so no one was making money from it at all. It was literally just a community of kind of independent artists, creative people, and just young people that wanted to mess around put videos on the internet, make stuff with, you know, cameras that they got for Christmas. Mm. And that's what YouTube was. It was this nerdy, obscure, wholesome scene of people just creating whatever they wanted and putting it up on the internet. So when I started, there were already people that were like, kind of being comedians 
So unlike Phil, who was like, I'm just gonna try out this, you know, press webcam. Ooh, look, I'm being filmed back in yeah. the day. I came into it seeing people that had already done full on web series and comedy yeah. sketches. And I was like, I'm bored and have nothing better to do with my life. I want to try making comedy sketches with the webcam on my laptop. So yeah. that's what I did. Well, before we go any further, shall we take it? We've got a, a montage uh, to oh, show God. you. I love a good this montage. Is, this is your montage. <laughs> <laughs> Montage gives a speeded up sort of a potted history of you mm -hmm. going from 100 views to playing the Enormo Stadium. Yes. So <laughs> let's fill in a little bit of the, of the stuff that happened in between that. Why, how do you keep going when there's only 100 people watching you? How, how, do you, did you believe that it was going to snowball, as you say, into something magnificent? I didn't believe it was going to snowball, but I think I was enjoying it and yeah. I was liking creating something for myself. It was my script, it was me filming it, and I, I was just in control of this little tiny television show, really, just on the internet. <laughs> yeah. um, but then it got to a point where Google said, hey, we could maybe let you earn money from this and it could be a job. Um, and so that was the point where I said to my parents, look, I'm doing this weird thing. I could either go <laughs> off and get a job or I could try this for a year and see where Sit it goes. Sit on the internet talking to strangers. Um, Are you being groomed, Phil? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't that, being that's groomed. That's how that went, yeah. probably. That was, yeah, a little bit of that. Uh, but in the end, um, I thought I was just gonna give it a go and my parents were like, yeah, sure have a go with it. And that's why it turned into more of a thing. It was quite good timing for you because you just finished university. Yes. So you were having that year where it was like, oh, now what I do have I do? to go and get a proper job. Thankfully started YouTube and it worked out. At the same time for me, I was studying law at Manchester University. Hideous. Ne don't study law, okay? Just do, <laughs> but do, do study if you study want to. your dreams. <laughs> It wasn't your dream. It wasn't my dream. Um, and then I took it a year out and literally I was like, oh, what am I doing? I'm working at Asda, just thinking about <laughs> whether I'm going to go back. I'll start Did anybody throw channel. a chocolate-based good at your head at any point? Yeah. Uh, no, but I did almost get fired for pretending that I had diarrhea and going to Reading Festival. <laughs> and then my manager phoned my mum saying, is Dan okay? I heard he's got some stomach problems. And she was like, he's at Reading. And I was like, <laughs> thanks, mum. So we've both had great careers in retail. Yeah. That have taught us a lot to this day. So you binned off uh, law at Manchester mm. and uh, by this point you'd met or you hadn't met? We yes. had met and we'd, I'd been doing it for like a year or so as a hobby. Phil had been doing it a couple of years and then it was kind of this terrifying, you know, this was before anyone was big on YouTube. You yeah. could kind of maybe pay a bit of rent, but not really. So it was a, a really terrifying commitment. Like no one even knew where the internet was going because this was pre Twitter and Tumblr and the big social media explosion. So it was still this niche community. So for both of us to go, let's just try being creative weirdos on the internet the whole time, it was scary. But then I think we are. Uh, it all worked out. Yeah, <laughs> I think as we were making more videos together, we developed more of a, a viewership of people wanting to watch Dan and Phil videos. Mm -hmm. Some of those people are there, hello. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and that, that really helped, and especially with Tumblr and Twitter, it developed into more of a fandom of people that were all enjoying watching our videos at the same time, and they were talking to each other and making friends through watching our videos as well. So they turned into their own little population of Dan and Phil viewers. Community. That were all friends and like enjoying our content. It was funny because a lot of people, they kind of have this viral success moment. Like you wonder, like, did this person that has a career on the internet just like have one viral hit overnight? Mm. But for us, it wasn't like that. It was years and years of nobody watching, doing it for no reason other than you enjoying it. And then slowly it came into place. And then I think around, when was it like 2011 or so? That's yeah. when Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, all this social media exploded. Suddenly every generation of young people growing up, there were millions and millions and millions just like suddenly on the internet and thankfully for us, because we'd already been there building up this thing, we, we had all this content ready for people to enjoy and then that's when suddenly the numbers started to become the things that impress people these days. Yeah. And that's where the revenue kicks in because when you get the numbers then people are interested and you can start making a living. Suddenly you can pay rent, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what is, your, what is your creative process? How do you go about making your videos? Um, I think a lot of it comes from real life experience. So if I have a situation where for example, I got bit, bitten by a squirrel. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As a random example, a random something example. that could happen to someone. That's a solid video there, so I can make a whole video <laughs> about that. Um, but also, it's, it's just thinking about something that I would want to watch personally, and like what would make me laugh, and then I can just put that on my channel, and hopefully people find that funny as well. It, so yeah. I, I, go, I try not to think about what the audience want, but more about what I would enjoy making. And I think I've always kept that mindset. 
which I think is different from some creators that are like, what do my audience need to see? What, what do I need to make? But I think it's good to just do what you enjoy and then it will come through the video as well. I mean, the funny thing about the internet and on YouTube is you can literally do whatever you Anything. want. There are no rules, there are no limits. Like, who are you, what are you interested in? You could make content about literally anything, which is kind of, you know, liberating, I can imagine, compared to the world of, you know, commissioners and producers and pitching something and it never going through. On the internet, it's just a complete free-flowing self-expression with no restrictions. But there's also kind of that terrifying oh God, if I can do literally anything, what the hell am I going to do? Mm. So for Phil, I mean, you were kind of just talking about your life yeah. and then that ended up just becoming more entertaining over time as Phil learned to use computers. <laughs> the more he got yeah. So Phil kind of <laughs> fell into comedy and it was the same for me. I was, you know, I was just kind of, oh, I'm going to make these short form comedy videos about my life and relatable topics. So when that became like my niche of what I do is like I make funny videos talking about funny things that happened in my life or opinions on stuff. That's just the idea. So I sit down and I usually just... Uh, Think about something that's horrendously embarrassing for me that will make other people laugh and maybe feel less. Do you bad now about both yourself. seek out horrendously embarrassing things? Yes, think, yeah. oh, that's material. <laughs> yeah, literally, which very thankfully happens so often. You have no idea. Like the time you got fired from work. Y yes, exactly. <laughs> like any horrendous, anxiety-inducing nightmare scenario becomes something that becomes great content two years later when it's just yeah. like softened down enough for you to dig out the wound again. I mean, you say it's very different from, from television, but mm. uh, because you can do exactly what you want. And I, I sort of take part of that, but at the same time, you have an audience and you know very well who your audience are. Mm. You are going to want to, to tailor your material for them. So you yes. are boundaried by that, certainly. That's, that's true. I mean, I wouldn't do a 14 hour monologue on YouTube in a black and white room, but that's not something I'd want to make anyway. <laughs> uh, Thankfully, that aligns quite well. Would you watch that, Sky? Yeah, <laughs> okay, maybe we'll I will. That. You get, you get you a, watch the first 30 seconds. <laughs> no, you're in for the long haul. I you think. could get a lot of ads on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no, you do, ha you do have to tailor it slightly uh, to, to the audience. So you, you are right that you're not going to go completely left field and people are like, wait, what, what am I even watching? This isn't the channel that I'm used to. Because I'm quite a PG channel, so I don't actually swear in my YouTube videos. Naturally. Um, so if I just suddenly uploaded a video like swearing and stealing things. Uh, Bad <laughs> film. Bad Because that's edge. Dark. Bad film. I've got to make some content dark stealing film. things. Um, yeah. I like to deploy dark film. Dark when you feel, film. When you feel you've had enough of the internet. That's going to be in five years. That, yeah. The inevitable cool. breakdown. That'll be the breakdown. Get ready for it. Um, no, but I, because I have an audience of people and I get emails saying, I like watching my videos with your kids because you don't swear in them and that's great. So <laughs> You suddenly feel compelled to not yeah, I wouldn't take loads of drugs on camera. Suddenly yeah. do that. Uh, because I think then that side of the audience would feel a little bit betrayed because that's mm. not what they're used to. Mm. But you're not the same, are you, Dan? Really? Well, it's kind of, you know... <laughs> <laughs> He's already dark, Dan. You're All just right. filth. I yeah. don't get put in the trending section on YouTube because I swear sometimes. Mm. It's, it's, you know, the thing that I've told myself and, you know, that's just who I am and I have to accept it. Um, you know, you can... It's about thinking, like, you got to where you were because you were doing what you want to do rather than thinking about an audience and what people and what's going to get the most hits. So there are, you know, you can tell when someone's just trying to kind of do what they think is going to get views or whatever's hot at the moment. But if you yeah. kind of, if you built an established audience and a following for your content because you were doing what you want to do, there's a, there's an element of as long as you're being true to yourself, then clearly that's worked so far. I mean, occasionally you're going to do something that's really self-indulgent and horrible and people are going to be like... There was an attempt, yeah. but you know, that's fine as long as you don't go in the 14-hour yeah. monologue route. It's interesting though, because you can't, you can't do everything now because YouTube has a new system where they will remove adverts from controversial topics. Like if you're talking about some things in the news or other things mm. like that, they can flag that and say, no, you can't have ads on that. It will stay on the internet, but you won't make money from it. So let's talk about making money from it. I mean, you're talking about, you, you're, again, you're saying that what, what you do is entirely up to you, mm. but it is sculpted by revenue generation, isn't it? I mean, you guys have to earn a living and ultimately, you know, you're, you're playing to, to uh, a, an audience mm. that's, that's essentially not paying you directly, but investing <laughs> in your future. Yes. I mean, it's, yeah, go on. Well, I, I, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> that, that's, that's, not, that's not the usual yeah. answer. Um, move on. <laughs> no, I think... It's, it's a good thing because it inspires you to make more videos because the more videos you make, the more revenue it will generate if people watch it. Um, and then it's, it's kind of a thing where it, just if people are watching the videos, then 
you'll get. Yeah, I mean, we're quite lucky just because we have such a big audience, which means we don't have to compromise on the content itself that much because mm. YouTube algorithmically, because you know, Google want people to stay on the platform, they prioritize uh, long content uploaded frequently because that's what keeps people sat on YouTube. So yeah. us who upload very short content, sometimes very infrequently, don't laugh. Yeah. Um, it's the complete opposite, but the re thankfully, because we have a big audience, that's okay. I mean, if we had a much smaller audience, we might not even be able to, you know, make a living off YouTube yeah. because uh, it's, you know, as you can imagine from, you know, like Jon Snow said, producing all this expensive content, putting it on Facebook, not getting anything back. Mm. There's that whole, you know, the the easier, the quicker, the cheaper, the longer the content, that's, that's just how life works, you know, when you're talking on the internet and keeping people on websites. So if you want to say, no, I want to make this, you have to accept that you're not going to be as successful as someone that might be playing into whatever the most successful algorithm is. Yeah, but that's, but that's fine. It's also good that we've got a gaming channel now because that's a lot. It's not easier content, but it's content that you can make more frequently because you are literally just playing a video game and recording it. <laughs> and we try and we try and make it funny as well. But we I could. I want your life. <laughs> we could. Um, <laughs> we could. I want, to, I want to put a camera on me playing video games. You should. So I, I, I would watch it, Sue. It's scr all I do is scream. I scream. But, whatever it is, I scream. Okay. Particularly well, with VR now, it's just me screaming and nobody wants to see that. <laughs> There's still a lot of setup that goes into it, though. I mean, all the people I'm sure you've heard of, the PewDiePie, and other yeah. people like him, just this side of the room. But uh, even then, it's it's very multi-talented. Like a YouTuber, they're not just someone that sits in front of a camera and talks. Because it's a completely independent discipline, really a YouTuber is someone that knows how to set up a camera, set up sound, set up lighting, uh, get ready for something, script something, perform something, take it into a computer, edit it, do the processing, upload it to YouTube, market it, sustain an audience and kind of live the PR responsible size, you know, public face of the channel as it mm. were. So even someone that is a gamer on YouTube, they spend an entire day just producing one gaming video and you might see 15 minutes of someone talking playing Minecraft but for them it's been six hours of every single discipline that goes into creating video entertainment rolled into one and that's an uphill struggle I mean like as you saw from those videos it's looked so bad at the start <laughs> for so long it was just absolutely terrible but it's really cool how as technology has come on and people have learned to do things and because you can go on YouTube search a tutorial for everything and before you know it a 16 year old could be a pro in using Final Cut X or something like that in two weeks so uh, it's really cool yeah mm -hmm. do you think there's still an element of snobbishness from from the television community about about <laughs> floggers I um, I, 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 you go, you go. Well, the thing is, I, I think... <laughs> was Phil just going to go, yes? Yep, no. Okay, no. The thing is, I think there's a bit of misunderstanding as to what the term <laughs> vlogger means and what YouTube is in general, because mm. it's kind of like pop music. Inevitably, the names that rise to the top are going to be the, the Britney Spears of YouTube. So if you're into the, you know, if, if you're not into vlogging, you're into filmmaking or sketch comedy or personal trainers or the infinite world of any kind of content out there, not all of them are going to be as big as the Britney Spears or Michael Bublé's of YouTube, which are the names that you've heard of. So to say that all YouTube is people daily vlogging and doing the kind of their own reality show, I mean, that's just wrong. Mm. I mean, there are filmmakers out there, there's young people, there's people doing charity work, there's, you know, the whole communities of social justice that are out there doing amazing things. But of course, you wouldn't hear about it because that's not the thing that gets the the most views. Um, so, and then again, at the same time, though, there's no reason to be snobbish about the people that have risen to the top and are the most popular people. Because mm. if someone is interesting and for years, say, say like Zoella, she was making videos for ten years, just like Phil, yeah. doing the things that she wanted, became one of the most popular people on the entire internet. And then I think you know, there's been a few instances where she hasn't been treated particularly nicely in the press or this, that, and the other. And it's like, what are you going to do if the young person's doing exactly what they do on the internet and they love and they're good at it? and it just so happens that millions of people want to watch it. You know, I mean, that's just how it is. Do you wish that, it, that, 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 that the sort of false barrier between television and the internet was a bit more porous? That, that, that each side would learn more from the other? I think it mm. is becoming more porous. I think now when we speak to people from TV, they understand what we do, which <laughs> uh, I think four years ago... It was it, not the case. It was always... Like, television has just understood the internet. No, I, I, not, the <laughs> internet is, not the internet itself, it's just like what YouTubers do and video makers online, I, it was always a conversation which would you'd have to start from the very beginning about like, what is a YouTube channel? And like how when does we this... started at the BBC. Yeah, when we started at the BBC, they took a, a risk with us because they were like, let's just 
let Dan and Phil have a radio show. But we went through the whole piloting system like everyone else. We weren't just like thrown into a show. Yeah. Um, but I think they were great because they trusted in us that we could actually do it and make an entertaining radio show and it wasn't just because we got loads of views on YouTube. I mean, if you think like five years ago, some people at Radio 1 actually thought about reaching out, like not now, like five, six years ago, reaching out to two people that were hits on YouTube and say, hey, you seem to be funny and entertaining, can you do radio? And then helping to nurture us. That was very forward thinking. Um, and but as we said, I mean, there were times where like uh, we won't show the clip, <laughs> but we were invited to go to the Teen Awards, which is Radio One's big kind of it happens in Wembley Arena, and they were like, "Do you want to interview One Direction?" In like 2011, and we were like, "Yeah." That was when they were the biggest the, thing. It was internet. like the hottest thing ever. So that was and crazy. there was like a whole food chain of people. You know, they're on the TV interview, they were on the arena tour, they were on the radio, then they were on the Radio One, you know, like digital social stuff, and then there was. Dan and Phil, and the only space left was the toilets of a cloakroom in the corner. In the of, arena. Yeah. So, so we had six and a half minutes with One Direction in a toilet. I was terrified. Which Some people sounds, would kill Yeah, I was yeah. about to say. You had to be there to understand how that wasn't a fan fiction scenario. That yeah, is, it kind of was. I'm going home um, immediately I've to read write a that, novella, though. an online novella about that. The next Fifty Shades. Yeah. So because you've, you've worked for, for, for radio, you understand the more formal process mm -hmm. that conventional media uses, as you say, sort of piloting and shaping things uh, that way. Would you, do you think television could learn from the instant... I mean, it's not, I understand you have to edit in all those processes mm -hmm. you talk about, but the, the more instant connection you can get with an audience and, and, and a, a slightly looser way of commissioning and developing shows? I think definitely the best thing about the internet is that it's global and it's instant and there's no restrictions on it. I mean, if our content was kind of restricted to being shown at a certain time in a certain geographic region and you can only access it by a certain way, we wouldn't be here today. Like, the things on the internet are as popular as they are because you're making this content and then it's just out there for everyone to enjoy. An example yeah. was uh, I did a documentary for BBC Three called The Super Gamers about eSports. I think you can still watch it. Someone's put it on YouTube. Um, yeah. But the, one of the funny things about it was, obviously, it goes out on BBC Three, and then it's on iPlayer. And I was saying, like, um, can we try really hard to, like, un block it just for once? Because it would be really cool. Like, there's literally millions of people on the internet that would love to see this documentary, but that's just not how it, it works, you know? It goes on BBC Three, and then it was on play iPlayer, and then eventually it just kind of fades into the... Because of the constrictions of the licence. Yes, exactly. And, you know, there's lots of reasons for that, but it's just... I was just imagining, like, if I just put that on my YouTube channel, then suddenly, like, millions of people would have been able to, to create this it. content. So sometimes we've had a lot of infuriating experiences where you mm. kind of get hit by that bureaucracy where it's like, for X, Y, Z reasons, you can't share this here, you can't quite do mm. that. Especially when we're working with uh, channels on, on, on big things, there's a lot of questions where people are like, this is how it is, and we're like, why? And it takes so long to, kind of to deprogram some people to think, if I can do that, I guess we should just try it and then see what happens. We're just so used to everything being global, so if we are in something that's only blocked to the UK and only people can watch it in the UK um, service, then we'll be less likely to want to share it with our audience because then everyone in America and Australia are like, well, how do we watch this? Like, we want to get involved as well, and they can't. And I think that's going to, I think that's going to change over the next five or so years because I think when things are put on the internet, ev like, everyone should be able to see it. Like the new American Horror Story trailer, I was excited to watch it. So I just went, sorry, this is not available in the UK. It's a trailer for a show. Why? Like, yeah. why? Everyone should be able to see it. I suppose um, that's a different model. It's about preserving, it's about keeping content yeah. and keeping IP, whatever, it, whatever it's about. But, but as you say, you come from a world where sharing is, is your first port of call mm. and there's no restriction on any of it. No. I think it's like someone's just going to torrent something if they can't get it within 24 hours. I mean, that's the fact that we all know, yeah. right? So it's like, oh, what, the trailer wasn't there on YouTube for Phil to watch? Well, that's okay, because 10,000 people have ripped it and put it on Tumblr or on some Russian website just because people want to see it. So I think it's like Netflix have been like, okay, boom, everyone in the world can watch this TV show at the same time. Like, inevitably, I think that's one of the things that, you know, you just have to give the people what they want because they're going to get it either way. Mm. Did you ever, I mean, when, I know you obviously studied law, etc. but did, did either of you ever think, I want to be on television? When you were little, was it an, were you ambitious to be performers as in a, that conventional sense? As a kid, I always wanted to be a weatherman, which, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I guess is uh, on television. So that was one of my dreams. Such thought, like a boy thing. What do you yeah. want to be when you want to, weatherman? Weatherman yeah, or definitely. ice cream van driver. They were my, my two ambitions as a child. 
Um, Both weather-dependent <laughs> professions, to be fair. <laughs> Definitely. Um, it, it was never a big ambition of me to be on TV, because I was always quite a shy kid as well. So I think through YouTube, I did develop more of a confidence to talk in front of a camera and learn some of those skills. But I think if you told Phil as a kid that I'd be like sat on a stage talking to loads of people, I think I'd have just like cried. sunk into the chair and mm -hmm. cried. Um, so no, I, I'd never thought about that um, when I was younger. I mean, it's like I was in that weird void where I think young people now, they grow up, it's the internet generation, that's the world. Uh, you know, anyone over 30, it was like pre that now. I, I was kind of like in the weird void in between. So it was like yeah. when I was like 16, 17, I was like, there's, it doesn't seem like there's much happening for young people, but then the internet was, and then I got on the internet as it was happening and it was fine. So it was, it was a bit weird for me because it was almost like young people once T4 had gone, there wasn't kind of much on TV for anyone under 30. I mean, regardless of who was actually watching it, like, you know, the vibe of what it was trying to communicate. And then there were, it seemed like there was just kind of E4 and BBC3 and BBC Three especially were commissioning like the young people shows. They, you know, the new comedy. I got my documentary on there, and then now it's gone, and it's kind of like, you know, it's gone, the, online. It's gone online. And you see the shows like there's, you know, things like Riverdale, Thirteen Reasons Why. There's shows that you know young people watch and they enjoy, and it's being out there and it's made. But there's still like, it just feels like there isn't much content. It, especially in the British TV world that's actually being made for young people. young people anymore. So it's a bit confusing. So when you say like to me, like, did I ever think about being on TV? It was kind of like, where, on what? And it was strange because over the years we've had conversations with yeah. like BBC Three, BBC Comedy, and for various reasons it didn't feel like the, the right time to try something out. And then like now, what would we do now? Yeah. Um, and, yeah. So yeah. now it's Netflix, YouTube Red, Amazon. And then that's like, if you want to go do something, that seems like that's... So if you were to take over commissioning uh, sort of terrestrial channels in the UK, what would, be, what would be the first things that you did to generate that sort of content for the under 30s? Well, I think, for example, Riverdale is the, one of the, <laughs> a good example because that developed such a huge mm. fandom. Instantly. In, in about two weeks since it was released on Netflix, there's like blogs about it, people are tweeting about it, people have changed their Twitter picture to Archie, it's everywhere. <laughs> I almost considered doing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. I think if you create something that appeals to young people, they're still going to watch it, and they're watching it religiously. They're watching it on repeat. And if that was on normal TV, I think everyone would be talking about Riverdale on Channel 4 or BBC3 or anywhere where they could see it. I mean, young people like stuff with edge. I mean, is it the, the Scandi drama? Is it, how's it pronounced? Scarm, thank you. I don't know if you guys have heard. It's kind of like the, the European skins yeah. but for this generation, and that's really hot because young people like social issues. They like things that seem a bit more progressive and reflective of their generation now. Um, but it's just that whole, it needs to be instantly accessible. It needs to just be there so that you can just give it to the internet. The internet will support it and love it, and then there we are, and it's happened. Mm. So it's not just about content and providing content that, that reflects and is, is interesting to young people, but it's also the fact that the whole, the whole lot needs to be dumped down on online and yeah. made available globally forever. Because yeah. it's the whole like, what is TV? Is it, a, is it a screen in your living room? Is it the content? Is it the, the channels, the brands that produce it? It's like, what does, what's the difference between TV and Netflix and Netflix and YouTube? And I think when you talk about what is TV for young people, you just need to think like, do people sit in front of a TV in a living room or are they just on their screens or are they on their laptops? And if you just make content that people want to watch, in a way that isn't restricted so that they could just access it and enjoy it and support it, then I think that's just how the world has naturally adapted to where we are today. Do you yeah. think it's just a fear that uh, people uh, that people have about embracing the fact that television is increasingly obsolete? The actual television, you know, the idea of the television set really by rights won't be, shouldn't really exist now, but it's certainly fading, <laughs> you know. Nobody really, that big thing, nobody really watches that very much anymore. They watch, they watch this. Yeah, I, th I think that is, that is a fear, but I, I don't think necessarily people are stopping watching it. Like, there are huge TV moments where you're all tweeting along with it, so you're watching the show, but then you're also like following yeah, the yeah. hashtag. Like, I think the last proper thing I watched was Bake Off with you, Sue. Uh, it's dead to me now, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, Flip the table. <laughs> um, Don't talk about it. But everyone was just following the hashtag and laughing along with it. And Young people it. love Bake Off. Yeah. Just putting it out there. That, that was a hit with every demographic. But that's, <laughs> I was watching the TV show because I wanted to be part of that moment. The and live I, experience. And I, I think there should be more shows that are like that, but then hopefully global so everybody can be part of that experience at the same time. 
It's funny, you were saying like, what can the kind of the internet generation learn from TV as well? And I think one of the reasons why it seems so kind of not porous and different at the moment is because obviously channels and traditional TV, it's this, these huge monstrous established kind of factories of producing this high quality content, whereas everything on the internet is literally individuals doing what they can independently as of themselves. And obviously you have people doing things on a bigger scale and they do films, but I think what it shows is and what people don't realize is the next generation of talent is obviously all gonna come from the internet, but there's no help. Like when we worked at the BBC and we were getting taught how to do radio, there were the commissioners, the producers, the editors, and there were all these people to you know, teach us how it worked and to kind of nurture us. And there was the first time we'd ever worked with producers who we could give ideas and then they'd actually help us to make something. It was so incredibly exciting because usually mm. we had an idea, we had to do it all ourselves. We had no idea what we were doing. Mm. And then suddenly there was this opportunity to elevate the ability of what we had to do by having you know, people with knowledge and expertise helping us. So I think that's what you know, it has to offer back is that the next generation of talent is gonna come from the internet, but they, they have no help. There's no one above them it's very hard to grow, which is why for us, things like YouTube Red, we did our, uh, we did a stage show and we toured it around the world and we did a documentary about it. And then we worked with YouTube Red to commission that into some movies. And they had a whole system of people that really just made all our dreams come true. They said, if you had a movie, if we did this, how would you want to do it? And then for the first time ever, especially when we were working on our book, and our stage show. That was us working with book editors, working with people from the West End that produce theater to take our ideas and our individual creativity, which is what you see on YouTube, and then suddenly giving it all of this help to grow it into something really massive. Mm. So essentially, they, the television is useful because it provides the, the, the sort of the mechanisms to make your ideas spectacular and to mm. realise them in the best and most professional way possible. Mm. Um, some of those systems sometimes fail because they don't maybe listen to the talent enough. Mm. Um, but you know, as you say, the, the, the best shows are made by everybody listening and everyone communicating, whether it's online or in more con conventional media. I just want to talk very briefly, just because I'm personally interested in the sort of neurosis and and youtube so it seems it seems to me I mean, neurosis abounds in, in you know in, in this room and in every other room in this conference <laughs> we can center. smell it but um what's interesting to me about the youtube generation is they're very open about anxiety mm. and i for me that's a double-edged sword you're you're discussing anxiety and you're you're putting yourselves out there and yet you're in a medium which invites in real time Abuse, commentary, oh, I, it's analysis, the worst place to be. criticism. <laughs> so yeah, you're you're mad. I mean, what, yeah. it's sort of a form of masochism. Why why do you do that? Are you aware of that? Do you look below, do you look essentially at the internet version of below the line? Do you read all the comments? I, well, I, I think for one thing, if someone is discussing anxiety or some kind of issue like that if one person is helped by that watching, I think that is worth it. So even if people are being mean about the video or commenting horrible things, I think if somebody has been helped out, then that's brilliant and then that was worth it completely. But for me, I, I tend not to, I tend not to get affected by negative comments. <laughs> I think Phil's now. weird. I'm, like I'm just going to put that out. Really? Like, every every I, YouTuber I know is so like, long. I was searching my name indirectly on Google. I cried for three weeks. Phil yeah. can just be like, ba 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 <laughs> glazed over. Um, I think it's just maybe because I've been doing it for so long. I yeah. just I try not to get affected by people that my content has obviously not been for. And if they want to say something like that, then that, that's their opinion, but I'm not going to let it make me stop making the videos because there's a hundred other comments that are saying something nice. And I think there is something where a YouTuber could focus on that one thing and then just change their content yeah, or, yeah. or do something different. Let it affect them too Yeah, much. or just be sad all day. And it's, it's like, why? There's so many more people. If the thumbs up rating is bigger than the thumbs down rating, <laughs> That's then all I think you need to know. you're on to a winner. It's only really. when it tips 50-50 that you like, really mm. have to think, did I say something offensive? Yeah. But for, you know, for, for, um, for, for the, you know, <laughs> A medium like the internet to be based on a sort of gladiatorial Roman <laughs> sort of, you, know, <laughs> you haven't evolved hugely. Trial by fire. Yeah. 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 I mean, we were born in the fires of the internet. I mean, like... A I love that quote. To, yeah. We were born in the fires of the internet. <laughs> but it's like, do you think There's like... There's poetry here today. A comedian would go and then they'd look at the reviews from the critics and they may be, be like stressed or something. It's like when you have comments of people saying like, I hope your mum gets eaten by a giant scorpion. It's like, that doesn't phase you. You know, yeah. it's like if you grew up in the mid 
naughty is just looking at the depths of the internet. You've seen like the dregs of humanity, so that's just like whoosh over, which probably means we're all like deeply emotionally deeply scarred. Deeply scarred. Yes. <laughs> we have no empathy compared to anyone else. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of people, when you say like talking about anxiety and things mm. like that, I, when you think about how progressive young people are, I think we, people aren't afraid to share their vulnerabilities because it makes them seem more real and open. And I think that's why people have such engaged audiences, because I think if people, I mean, my whole brand is literally just telling it everything that's wrong about my personality and people pointing and laughing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's a good thing. I love the fact that you, you, you know your own brand, though. And then, and yeah, that's suffering. To me, yeah. <laughs> Awkwardness and suffering and yeah. pain. Um, so, bearing in mind you both made very successful careers out of being honest about where things go wrong, I think we've got a little VT where oh, there God, are some no, not the... oh, this, mishaps. This is our attempt at baking, or attempts. <sighs> These aren't just brownies, Dan. This is going to be a brownie graveyard. Yeah, it is. If you bring that into a room at a Halloween party, everyone will crack themselves. They will. We are making pumpkin spiced pumpkin cookies. Oh my god. That's right. You said pumpkin twice. What does this mean? Look at these babies. <laughs> I'm not sure about that one. That was a bit like a whale. Or we'll something. see what happens. <laughs> that is Cyclops Joe. That is Mummy Steve. That is pumpkin three. <laughs> Bill. I can own the creativity of everything. Green velvet cakes. Oh my god, I see what you're going for. Yes, I did love the zombie. Look how green they are. <laughs> They're so green. Well done, Phil. So look at this ghost <laughs> that I was so proud of. What, what even is that? It's scary. It's got a wonky eye. It's okay. like, kill me. But then Dan comes along and makes the best Shrek cake you've ever seen. This is, it's the best thing I've ever made. That looks like a spider that's just been swatted by something. <laughs> it does. They look kind of crap. Monster pops. <laughs> that is... Oh no, what's happening? Oh my god, I've had a casualty. Oh no. No. <laughs> Oh my Man god, down. the monster's head is caved in! Sorry, mate. He's a mistake. He is a monster that got hit by a car. <laughs> Whoops. Bill! <laughs> Today we're going to be attempting something we have never tried before in uh -huh. our entire lives. Pastel, meringue, Easter. What's it called? What are they called? Pastel lemon meringue. Why did we decide to make meringue? We don't have an electronic whisk. Uh, I'm going to have one giant arm at the end of the video. <laughs> 5,000 hours it's of been so long. Kill me! Wow, that's a, that's a very small hole you made. I could have made there. a bigger hole. It's an egg! That's how not to make a hole for the rack. <laughs> oh my Ooh. god, Phil, you're so. Ah! Wait. No, no, you're the least delicate person in the world! It's good! They look like devil horns, I'm just putting it out there. Phil, you just knocked the eggs oh, away. No, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Ooh. This thing yeah, with the bunny ears. I know. That, that kind of was a disaster. I don't yeah. think we missed that enough. It looked like a fail, but it didn't taste like a fail. What is ugly on the outside can be beautiful on the inside. That, that is... is the moral of this video. Like, as we all know, people love baking, and mm. we honestly, we try so hard every time. We don't intend for it to be comedy, but it's just a complete disaster. Did you learn nothing from seven series of baking? No, no, we tried. We, we literally watch every season. Yeah, just... Mary Berry would cry if she saw any She would have an aneurysm if she saw it. <laughs> no, no, she wouldn't. Actually, no, what she would say is her catchphrase when any, anything she saw was really bad, which is, looks informal. Always informal. informal. So informal. That's Mary Berry for end of days carnage. <laughs> but we did actually get some attention from Gordon Ramsay. Oh, off, uh, did you? You know yeah. he does that thing where people tweet him pictures of the food they're cooking at home. Yeah. Well, yeah. thankfully, one of our lovely supportive audience, without you know our consent, tweeted a picture of those failed meringues at Gordon Ramsay, and he actually do we noticed. Have, do we have, it, the, uh, if we have the picture of that. Which was, yeah, so they look like oven baked faked turds. One's got diarrhea and now you're covering them in chocolate, so thanks for thanks, that. Thanks, Gordon. Th they got us roasted by Gordon to five million people. Yeah. One's got diarrhea and now you're. <laughs> We're not going to get too heavily into that. Let's no. Not um, but from every, basically, from every failure, you get a great YouTube video. So that that is yeah. a, you know, a cosmic metaphor for how every kind of terrible thing we can turn yeah. to ironic content. Can yeah. we remove this now? It's getting yeah, flashbacks. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <Hide> that. <laughs> so may I be so bold as to ask how old you are now? I'm 30 now. Because I've been doing it 10 years. It's over for it's you. It's over. It's like Logan's run the internet, past 30. <laughs> yeah, that, I, was scared, I was scared everyone's going to stop watching it on my birthday, but thankfully, <laughs> they're still there. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, oh no! <laughs> 
come from? I was going to go with that. <laughs> we still love you. Yeah. We made his 30. <laughs> um, how old are you? Yeah. I'm 26. So I I've, yeah, I've just, <laughs> I, I don't know, my life's just flying by. <laughs> So I've just had my quarter life crisis. Um, Have you? Yeah. Oh, but at least you can make a video of it. It's exactly. All fun. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, bearing in mind you're already now what the grandfathers of YouTube. Yes. How do you, how do you see yourself remaining relevant? I know that's a stupid question to mm. ask people who are 30 and 26, but you know, bearing in mind you're at the front line. Yeah, I think if you actually look at YouTubers in general, there are a whole range of ages of people yeah. making content. It has no matter. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it actually matters so long as people still want to watch it. True. Um, so I, I'm not too worried because I'm still enjoying it. And as long as I still got that person in Australia watching my videos, <laughs> I'm going to keep doing it. You'll be fine. Yeah. Do you think that's how it will end when you're sort of in your 80s? It will go slowly back to the one. Yeah, Ooh. just the one. Just the life the cycle. The same guy same. or girl in Australia. 140. In the outback yeah. going, that I love happen. you, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> But it, in an Australian it, accent. It's, it's you, isn't it, Sue, just doing an accent? Yes, it is. It is. All right, I, I will own it now. It's, it's me, yeah. Um, but there, is a, there, is a, there might be. I mean, I don't know if you feel that there's a, there's a, a crushing sort of need to always be relevant. But mm. thankfully, you guys are just, as you say, motivated by things that happen in your own life and you're not too bothered by the immediacy of the outside world. You're kind of insulated from it in your videos, aren't you? Mm -hmm. You don't have to be, you know, a finger on the pulse all the time. Well, you can if you want. I mean, that's how to stay uh, topical and relevant. Yeah. But I mean, the thing is, the internet is only going to get bigger and bigger. So as long as you're still being entertaining as you always have been, there's no reason why any YouTuber would decline in popularity. Like, as long as you're still putting out good content and you have an audience, then that's fine. And as for where the actual future's going, God, none of us know, do we? Yeah. We're all just making it up as we go along at this point. Um, We're like, people have come here hoping that you would have the answers. Yeah. No what one is the has answer? the answers. We're just the guinea pigs, like, seeing what happens to us in, in 10 more years. Shaking in the corner yeah. of the cage. <laughs> yeah. What would you like to see happen? I and mean, we've talked a little bit about how you'd like to see uh, television perhaps adapt to, to, to some of the... Uh, the tropes of the internet, but what would you, if you were, if you were the commissioners of Channel 4 or the BBC for a day, what would be the sort of things that you'd implement? I think um, it's about the, the strategy of accessibility and just adapting to the times. And it's like, you know, millions of people watching live TV in front of a box isn't always going to be the case because people are doing it whenever they want on whatever devices they want. But then as we saw from like the Channel 4 Facebook stats, there's still a, the, the biggest audience anyone's ever seen out there. So I think it's just about adapting to the times. But then I think that young people aren't being serviced enough by the amazing ability to make great content out there like Radio 1, um, BBC3, uh, they do lots of stuff for, like social action campaigns, you know, mm. things helping young people. And it, There's too few of that. I, th I think there's too few like quality entertainment and drama being made for young people. And as I said, the other way around, I think there's a lot of talent on the internet that's kind of maybe being left to the wayside and ignored. And I think that if people just talk to each other and kind of like share the young perspectives and the talent and then share the expertise and the, you know all of the the amazingness that's been built up over the years to produce the stuff I think that there's no reason why things can't just get bigger and better for everybody as the world gets more connected that seems a wonderfully <laughs> positive note to almost wrap things up it like, doesn't wow. matter because artificial intelligence is going to kill us all in 10 years yeah, so there you go bad that's, robot that's, that's the, the Dan I there. know yeah. Um, how about you, Phil? Just to end. What would you, what would be your if you were, if you were you know the boss? If I was the boss, I would be the weatherman on. <laughs> <laughs> on that's on it. The six o'clock news. End game. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I I agree with Dan. I think I, I just want to see more things for young people on the television because then people won't complain that young people aren't watching television because there'll be more stuff for them to watch, uh, which seems like the obvious answer. Uh, <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, just more of global events that everybody can watch at the same time. I think Game of Thrones runs through a trick that you can watch it at the same time as America now. I think that's brilliant. Uh, even if you've got to stay up till three in the morning, it's worth it. Um, I think there should be more global events. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to happen. And it is exciting. It's exciting to switch on uh, your skybox at two in the morning and think I'm watching, you know, a yeah. dragon at the same time as somebody on yes. the west coast of America and I'm screaming as a dagger gets produced at the same time as somebody <laughs> and I don't know. Yeah. It's, it, it, you're right. So to try and create more gl global brands and bigger events. Uh, yeah. It, they're often, I'm sure there are, uh, are, um, are, are sessions labelled almost exactly this in, in, uh, in this year's um, conference, but 
what, when you talk about making more content for young people, people always say, but what is that content? And I think you answered part of that because you said, you know, young people are socially aware. Mm -hmm. Don't patronise them. Don't, they're not, you know, they, they, they want to take a very active role in shaping the planet. If you would say, if people here are interested in what sort of content that should be, what would be your response? Well, I think there's lots of dramas that are being produced in America and across Europe that are showing that you can still do it and appeal to young people, whether it's Scum, Riverdale, 13 Reasons Why. I mean, there's, there's hit shows all the time that yeah. young people love. There's factual stuff, documentaries, things that, uh, you know, it, any kind of thing that explores what life is like now for young people and answering questions, people will care about it. Like, there's so many young people out there and they're so engaged and they want to talk and support stuff, but they just feel like we're all doing that to ourselves and it's all, yeah. you know, we're having these discussions within our own communities, but there's no reason why that can't be something that we all come together to be a part of. Yeah. Let's take a straw poll. What do, what do you guys watch? Silence now. TV. Yeah. Um. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't be silent for that too long. long. <laughs> Oh, God. That answers that. For anyone in television, we are now dead. <laughs> We've reached peak television. Listen, our session's are pretty much done. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank Dan and Phil. Thank you. Thank you.